The case of Tupac Shakur is a mystery that's had everyone's head scratching as to who the actual shooter was that fateful night and who put money on Tupac's head. Well, after 30 long years, Las Vegas police have finally decided to do something about it by arresting a man named Keith D, who has been all over the internet bragging about his involvement in the assassination of Tupac. But now his trial is underway, and things are looking like we may actually be able to seal this case once and for all as recent news surfaced that a public defender has been appointed to Keith D. For 27 years, the family of Tupac Shakur has been waiting for justice. We are here today to announce the arrest of 60-year-old Dwayne Keith Davis, a.k.a. Keefe D, for the murder of Tupac Shakur. Davis was arrested this morning by my LVMPD criminal apprehension team, and this investigation started on the night of September 7th, 1996. It is far from over meaning this trial is just one more step closer at finding the real shooter and finding out if Diddy was the one who really gave the order to get rid of Tupac. When word spread that Tupac's life was brutally cut short in Las Vegas due to a drive-by shooting, it sent shockwaves through the hip-hop community, plunging fans into deep despair. His death quickly marked him as one of the most impactful people in the hip-hop world. He didn't only inspire some of the most notable artists of this era, but some affirm he's the reason they chose to pursue music at all. The mystery of who shot Tupac has left everyone confused and looking for answers. Without a clear suspect, people started to wonder if the man driving the car, Shug Knight, had something to do with it. There were rumors that Tupac was thinking about leaving Death Row Records, which made Shug Knight, the boss of the record company, furious. But when people asked Knight if he wanted to leave, he said that Tupac was the kind of guy who would have cussed you out for saying something like that. There was a, a report earlier this week in the New York Post that Tupac was looking to leave Death Row Records. Mm -hmm. Is that true? You should answer that. You don't take a person like Tupac who, if you listen to every song on All Eyes on Me, every song on Machiavelli, every time he do an interview, what's the first thing he say? Death Row. Tupac loved Death Row. Tupac loved me. I loved him. I mean, Tupac took Death Row to the next level. I mean, we, we worked hard and we... We laid the foundation down, and Snoop took the baton, and he ran with it, and he did a great job with it. When Tupac got the baton, not only did he win the race, he finished so fast that he was able to sit back and drink some Thug Passion and come up with another plan. I mean, if, if a person, if you'd ask Tupac that question, that he was he planning on leaving death row, he definitely would have cussed you out. Now fast forward to today, and most of these questions that have plagued this case may be able to be solved once and for all. With Keith D on trial for the murder of Tupac and not having an actual good lawyer, it is more of just an interrogation at this point for the prosecutors to ask their burning questions like, who pulled the trigger, or did Diddy play a role in the assassination of Tupac? Well to answer that question, Keith D was in the car from which the fatal shots were fired. Lane starts blasting, um, you say Shug looks over, he sees you. Uh, he looks right at you? Yeah, he looks at me. Okay. When he looks over at you, and then, you know, Tupac's busy getting shot. Uh, evidently, the story is Tupac's trying to either get out of the back line. seat or something. Yeah, what do you see happening inside of their car? In. I seen a bullet going shoot again. I thought he was dead. I thought he was dead. So Orlando shot him this car across Dre? He leaned over on the window. We rolled down the window, popped. Who was it? They would throw on my side, I would pop them. You know what I'm saying? But they was on the other side. Right. That ended Tupac Shakur's life, with his nephew being identified as the shooter. Moreover, Keith D claims that it was Diddy who offered $1 million for the hit. Keith D has openly talked about this, sharing details with everyone from law enforcement to media figures like DJ Vlad for almost 20 years. I'm not going to go into details on that one. Keep your streets on me. I ain't going to go into detail on that. Well, I'm going to go ahead and read from the book. Well, so th let them buy the book then. Okay, well, I'm just going to read the, this passage. Uh, the shit was on. Tupac made an erratic move and began to reach down beneath his seat. It was the first and only time in my life that I could relate to the police command, keep your hands where, where I could see them. Instead, Pac pulled out a strap, and that's when the fireworks star started. One of my guys from the back seat grabbed the Glock and started busting back. The first shot skinned Shug in the head, and I thought that motherfucker was dead. 
I had heard some stories, supposedly, that Tupac, that Suge used Tupac as a shield when the bulls started flying, but that's some bullshit. Suge was already wounded, and he was the one that got touched. As the rounds continued flying, I ducked down so I wouldn't get hit. Basically, yeah. Determining whether Keith D's allegations could lead to Diddy's conviction is complex. At most, Diddy could be charged with solicitation to commit murder, but proving this in court would require a reliable witness and additional evidence. Without such proof, creating a solid legal case against Diddy is challenging. His defense team could exploit any weakness in the prosecution's case, potentially leading to a scenario reminiscent of the outcome for rapper Shine, whose own legal troubles made headlines two decades earlier. A pivotal figure in this narrative was Eric Von Zip Martin, who reportedly acted as an inner intermediary between Diddy and Keith D following the hit on Tupac. It is rumored that the promised $1 million never reached Keith D, but was instead retained by Von Zip, who allegedly invested it in his nightclub. With Von Zip passing away in 2012 and no subsequent evidence surfacing, the trail has since gone cold. There's also, you go into the book, that apparently there was supposed to be a million dollars that Zip was supposed to bring back but he ended up keeping the money and buying a nightclub with it. That's what the FBI said. The FBI said that. Yeah. Yeah. You guys never got any money. Never. For anything. Nothing. Not even a pair of Sean John draws. You know what I'm saying? That's crazy. Shine, a protege that Diddy had vowed to nurture, emerged as an icon in the late 90s, a tumultuous era marked by the void left by Biggie and Tupac. But to overlook the rise of new talent that surged to fill in the gap that the two left would be an injustice to the booming voices of the time, among which Shine was a standout artist. Hailing from Belize, yet shaped by Brooklyn's unforgiving streets, Shine's raw edge caught DJ Clark Kent's attention. During a freestyle outside a local barbershop, captivated by Shine's undeniable gift, DJ Clark Kent swiftly introduced him to Diddy. With the wound of Biggie's passing still raw and his posthumous release pending, Diddy saw in Shine a fierce lyricist with an unmistakable thirst for success. He promptly inked a deal with him. The signing turned Shine into an instant millionaire. With a wealth of assets including millions in cash, three luxury vehicles, two properties, and a contract for five albums, this was an unparalleled arrangement in 1999. Similar to an athlete's Supermax deal, anticipation was hyped up for Shine's debut album that had the industry on the edge of its seat. But disaster struck, derailing Shine's rise to fame and revealing Diddy's true colors. A chaotic evening at a high-profile nightclub filled with celebrities was the right mix ready for disaster. Diddy, Shine, and Diddy's then-girlfriend, Jennifer Lopez, found themselves at the heart of the havoc. Although the full narrative of that night remains mysterious, the fallout was starkly clear. Shine ended up handcuffed, slapped with grave charges including attempted murder, assault, and illegal weapon possession. Both Diddy and his bodyguard faced accusations linked to the shooting, but it was during the trial that the industry's facade crumbled, especially for Shine. Following a year of relentless media coverage and legal battles, the judgment was passed. Diddy and his bodyguard walked free, acquitted of all charges. In stark contrast, Shine, once poised for great received a 10-year sentence. It was a stark betrayal. Diddy had abandoned his mentee, prioritizing his own welfare. The treachery was blatant, leaving the community and Shine himself in shock. Once Diddy's protege, Shine was now a casualty of his devotion. The music world reeled, torn between criticizing the judgment and scolding Shine's choices. From his cell, Shine fought back with music, releasing a 2004 album that underscored his unyielding artistry and spirit. Man, I was just praying from the precinct you understand? To when I got my bell, you understand? The next day I was like, yo, I gotta be in the studio. You understand? Because it was like that whole year, man, I was just getting my mind right. He was about to shoot the video for Bad Boys and all that. You understand? So I was just praying, like, sure. God, you know, you know, you know where my heart is at. You know how I do. You know I ain't wrong. You understand? So. Just give me this chance, man. You know what I mean? Dreams of pardon were fleeting for Shine, but as soon he was out of jail, he was deported back to Belize. Diddy's actions had buried another artist to the ground, much like Biggie's fateful end. Regardless of Shine's fate, Diddy remained triumphant, a pattern so predictable that the idea of Ice Cube's potential threat has to unsettle him. Ice Cube, known for his blunt honesty, is a force that even people like Diddy may fear. That's when questions like, why does Ice Cube care, and how could he affect this case involving Diddy? The answers may lie in Cube's roots and and reputation. Growing up tough in South Central LA, Cube turned his life experiences into groundbreaking music with NWA. Unlike Diddy, Cube earned his stripes and street credibility, which he carried through a solo career marked by the bold track No Vaseline that took aim at his former NWA members. Ice Cube on Pump It Up. I got all suckers 100 miles and run. I'd like to give a shout out to the DOC. 
Y'all can't complain. How have things changed since Ice Cube left? Bettered. Yeah, it got better. For real. It's way better. You know, because ain't no ego trips in the group anymore. Never make peace with each other? No peace. No peace. Cube's authenticity extended to his influence on Tupac, mentoring him and helping shape his revolutionary music and message. Their paths were similar from music to movies. They both made a significant impact. Cube's film debut in Boys in the Hood paralleled his music's raw storytelling, while Tupac's role in Juice showcased his own formidable talent. Their lives were entwined even in Tupac's shift to Death Row Records, where his style became more aggressive, a change that Cube himself couldn't identify with. As controversies and conspiracies swirl around Tupac's and Biggie's deaths, with fingers pointed at Diddy and Shug Knight, Ice Cube's potential role in bringing new insights or justice to the cases looms large. His history of confronting issues head-on suggests that, despite the passage of time, his voice and actions could still have a profound effect on the unresolved mysteries of hip-hop's most tragic chapters. Now the questions we leave you with is, does Diddy have a bigger role in the case of Tupac, or did Pac catch a bullet in retaliation from a rival that he and his entourage encountered during the Mike Tyson fight? Let us know what you think down in the comments below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and if you did enjoy, watch this video next.